This is the Moonlight Graham Show, a freewheeling conversation with the role players, the underdogs, and guys with flat out great stories in sports. Hello and welcome back to the Moonlight Graham Show. Once again, I am your host, Tim Flattery, and it is supposed to be Field of Dreams Week here in the state of Iowa. Field of Dreams Week here on the Moonlight Graham Show. And of course, we were prepared with so much great Field of Dreams content in preparation for the Major League Baseball game that was supposed to be taking place this Thursday at the Field of Dreams movie site in Dyersville. It was supposed to be the first ever Major League Baseball game in the state of Iowa, but that that game, due to COVID precautions, is being pushed back a whole year. So the state of Iowa is going to have to wait a whole another year for that game and so we're going to shelve our field of dreams content for the time being and bring you a special edition episode of the moonlight graham show our moonlighter for today is one of the most famous actors from the state of iowa especially that still lives in the state of iowa he was made famous from those iowa nice guy videos that went all across YouTube and the internet about five or six years ago. They were featured on ESPN for two college football seasons. They were hilarious. They really portrayed the state of Iowa in a really fun and great way. And of course, took plenty of shots at the rest of the Big Ten, the rest of the Big 12, especially the state of Nebraska and Nebraska football. You guys know him as the Iowa nice guy. I know him as Scott Sipker. He is our moonlighter for today. It was so great to get Scott on the podcast to not only talk about his character, the Iowa nice guy, but also the rest of his film and stage career. Scott has made a really nice living for himself here in the state of Iowa as a professional actor. You know, so often you see these actors, and we've had some of them here on the podcast with Ben Ollers and Dwyer Brown, who have made a living for themselves in New York and in in L.A., and that's really where, where most of the entertainment industry is. Now, Scott has carved out a nice career for himself here in the state of Iowa. He lives just about 5, 10 miles away from where I live, and he is a professional actor. So I thought that was kind of cool to talk about. But not only that, he's also a sports fanatic. So we spend a lot of time talking about Scott's athletic career. The guy grew up in Carroll, Iowa. He's a sports nut. He loves to play and watch and talk about sports. So this was a really fun conversation. It's probably my most Joe Rogan-esque podcast that we've done in a really long time we we tell a lot of stories scott tells a lot of stories he talks a lot about you know some of the great moments he's had on the athletic fields throughout his career along with the ins and outs of the entertainment industry and i think you guys are really going to love this perspective in this episode of the moonlight graham show and of course if you like what we're doing here on the podcast make sure to subscribe to the moonlight graham show wherever it is that you get your podcast apple podcast google play stitcher spotify subscribe Subscribe to the Moonlight Graham Show, and you know the drill, guys. Leave us a five-star review. You can also follow the show on social media, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. We love hearing from you guys each and every week. So enjoy today's episode with Moonlighter Scotty Sipker. Scott Sipker, welcome to the Moonlight Graham Show. I almost feel like this is long overdue. You know, I wouldn't admit that I've... Been upset that this podcast has been on for years now. How many years? Three years, Scott. Three years. Three and a half. And uh, I've seen many people that I know uh, come on. I was not asked. Many of the people say, like, uh, anybody of the Chris Williams ilk, I'm better than. And I still was I was very perplexed. Is this a podcast that has less talented people on? Maybe that's your angle. <laughs> uh, but I'm finally happy now that you've... Decided to christen the Moonlight Graham podcast with me, and uh, in all seriousness, really, I, I appreciate it. I I uh, love talking, as many people know, and um, and it's been nice to see this podcast start very grassroots like and just grow strong. We've hung. We're hanging on. You're hanging on. We're and, hanging uh, on. You're you're doing more than hanging on, if I do say so myself. <laughs> well, thank you, Scott and. This is not a video podcast, so people can't see us on YouTube right now, but we are enjoying some 
what they call hooch moonshine and you know what some people have told me is the original templeton rye so there's some bootleg stuff that a buddy of mine shout out to heath stein shelby county guy not a carroll county guy oh. he gave me a bottle of this stuff so it's supposed to be legit uh, shelby county you're trusting somebody from shelby county well you know there's a lot of good catholics down there that, that's so true. <laughs> when was the first time you had you know not the bottled templeton rye but the bootleg stuff scott i had the now, we're admitting to a felony at this moment. I just want you to realize. That's okay. We're talking hypothetically. 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 Like I said, say, not a yes. video podcast. Um, I had the bootleg Templeton Rye long before the commercialized Templeton Rye, uh, which is really good. And I have that on my shelf at home and happy to see it find a home in Templeton. And uh, the Kirkhoff family is great. And, and I know Scott Bush and all those guys who got it started. Uh, so being from Mount Carmel, which is a really tiny town in, in Carroll County, uh, and my house, which is what I grew up in is the house that my grandmother grew up in, that she was raised by her great, my great grandparents, her uh, mom and dad, obviously. Um, and in our house, we actually have the strangest, creepiest basement it doesn't really it's not finished it's just kind of dirt walls that have been concreted over like a farmhouse basement absolutely and but there's a there's a secret door that mm. leads into um a very creepy small room that has a trap door above it that leads into the dining room and that's because in that secret room is where they made hooch when my grandmother was very small um, and then they would pass it upstairs through the uh, trap door that's still there it's carpeted over now but yeah i can step on it and you can hear the hollowness so i'm well versed in carroll county hooch and the thing about just to um i know i'm already rambling but when you when people say the original templeton rye i think something that's important for people to remember is that templeton rye is almost a genre of whiskey it's not really one type now it is because uh, it's become a commercialized brand. But back in the day in Prohibition, Templeton Rye just referred to rye whiskey that was made in, in, a, that area. in that area because each farm would have their own recipe. It would be somewhat similar, right? But you'd have farmers who are making their own batch with their own recipe and their own rules and their own equipment, <laughs> of course, that they probably all just put together themselves uh, just being resourceful. So Templeton Rye, you would get a different... Uh, a different style of Templeton Rye depending on what farm you got it from. So you come from a family of felons. Yes. It uh, <laughs> turns out to be true. I'm I'm an outlaw. I mean, people look at me, they think, wow, I'm surprised, Scott, that you don't have a ton of tattoos and ride motorcycles. But I'd like to buck the trend <laughs> of my family. Well, it's funny. As I was looking at your your highlight reel or your demo reel. I'm not sure what you call it on your website today, scottsipker.com. Oh, my goodness. And that it, has not been updated for like, Oh my! You play years. you play an outlaw in a lot of those roles on your demo reel, and yeah. it seems like that works well for you. Like the Tommy gun, the fedora, the vest. Like it seems like you really like that era. Yeah, the 1930s is um, in prohibition era is one of my favorites in American history. Um, it, it's obviously a very dark time, uh, but it it really it, it's an important part of the evolution of our country. And specifically here in Iowa, um, we had this weird connection to the mob and to the big cities. The, what you're referring to is a project that me and my film partners put together called Valentine Road about hit men uh, from Prohibition who uh, get come, have to come to Iowa and um, solve some problems, let's just say. That's right. Uh, and we actually filmed quite a bit of that. We did film the trailer and a prologue and uh, kind of a first episode. Uh, and that was actually going to be the project we thought was going to take us uh, to the top. Unfortunately, it turns out that you need millions of dollars to shoot a <laughs> 1930s period piece. And eventually we did Iowa Nice instead. But Valentine Road is still the dream project of my film company that the one thing that we continue everything we do now is working towards getting better at filmmaking and getting a name enough to be able to raise the money possible to tell this fictionalized historically set iowa story so al capone is famous for 
renting out the top floor of a, of a hotel in Fort Dodge. So I'm from Fort Dodge and the Warden Hotel in Fort Dodge, which is now they're trying to refurbish it, but it's going to take a lot of money and they're looking at government grants and things like that. But apparently he owned or rented for a long time the top floor of that hotel. So I, my only, if you get the money together, my only suggestion would be to film parts of it in Fort Dodge, which is a great bootleg town, Rivertown, Scott. Yeah, yeah, I, uh, we absolutely, I, I would, I we would definitely film in Iowa. Uh, the 25 minute episode that we shot, the very first episode that was kind of a pilot that we've never released. Uh, we shot that all at the Salisbury House here in Des Moines, Ooh. and in the, in the trailer, you don't, you don't. Those are authentic weapons that you're seeing. We had a historian come in uh, who's a gun expert, um, and my uh, partner in crime, Brendan Dumfrey, plays the man in black. I play the man in brown. Uh, and the man in black, his favorite is a, is a Thompson submachine gun or a Tommy gun. And my weapon of choice, is you, if you go and watch this, is the Browning automatic rifle. Uh, which is Hence shoots Mr. The, Brown. Yes, and it shoots the uh, .30-06, so it's got some pop behind it but uh one of the things that's funny about rural iowa is uh that every town i'm not saying fort dodge is lying i'm not but every town has an al capone story i'm serious you go go to any town and do al capone not. stayed there or he got do shot not. there or he shot other people there or his people shot other people there like every town has an al capone story and it's one of the best things about iowa well, the one in Fort Dodge is true. Everybody else is probably lying about that. For that, I'm sure. But, Scott, as you well know from this podcast, we're sports podcasts, right? And That's so right. You're, you're the third actor we've had on the pod. We had Dwyer Brown, who played John Kinsella in the movie Field of Dreams. We had Ben Ollers, who is on a new Quibi show, and he's got an upcoming HBO show um, coming up here. He's, he's from Fort Dodge. So you're the third actor. So before we get well, into first. Thank you for calling me an actor. I appreciate it. Well, I mean, what, what would you call That's yourself? That's what I would call myself, though. Sometimes it feels like it's been a long time since I've actually acted, and uh, we'll get back to it. But I appreciate very much calling me an actor. So before we get to your acting career, more about your acting career, I do want to talk about your athletic career. Oh, Because yeah. the one thing about being from small-town Iowa... Carroll, Iowa. You know, there's two good high schools in Carroll. There's a Catholic school there's and there's only a public one. school. There's only one. And there's a good rivalry between the two, which I think make, and both schools are about the same size, which is interesting uh, for Carroll. But what makes small town Iowa great is kids, no matter your level of athleticism, everybody plays sports. And that's still true to this day, where you have a lot of kids that, hey, they're not planning on playing in college or, you know, they're not on the travel squads, but they still played three high school sports and on at the varsity level. And I think that's kind of cool. And I know you played quite a few sports when you were growing up and throughout high school. So what was the biggest, what was the greatest athletic accomplishment of your athletic career, Scott? For me, if we take out uh, being the oldest kid in the sand lot and in Mount Carmel, so I was able to do a lot of things the littler kids couldn't do. Uh, if we take that out of the equation, for me, it's it's simple. It's um, it's uh, high school golf. I was lucky enough to be on two teams that my junior and senior year that went to state. Uh, my senior year, I was able to be. This sounds so braggadocious. I never talk about this. So again, thanks for asking me. I, I was uh, first team all conference. Hey. Uh, my my senior year. Unfortunately those situations come with a bit of sourness. Not that I'm not over what happened in high school, but I'm not over it. My junior year, we had the best team in state. Uh, and I'm not being biased. We just, we frankly, we did. And the very first day at state, um, we played up at uh, Gates in Waterloo. And um, we ended up at having on day one, had the 10th out of 10 scores. The, the wor we had the worst score of the day. Everybody just get the shanks that day? Well, I certainly did. And the very first tee, which I still remember, is one of the most embarrassing things that's ever happened to me. And anybody who's followed my career knows that's a statement. Three kids teed off in front of me. I, I went last. One uh, jacked it out of bounds, and the other two just hit hard slices, just way onto like to other fairways. So I got up, and I was very confident. I had the great big Bertha at the time. Driver was my best club in the bag. And I thought, I'm going to show these people. This is the first time I'd ever shot, hit, taken a shot in front of a crowd of 
there's probably, I don't know, 30 people there, including my, my dad, my mom, and my brother, who was three years younger than me, or is three years younger than me. And I remember being so jacked up, I was going to show off on this shot on the first tee, and I pulled my head, and I hit it about 15 feet. <laughs> and I end up taking a nine on the first hole. Oh, uh, man. I, I, I shot in the 90s, uh, 96, um, that first day, which is all just so embarrassing. But the sad thing is, or bittersweet thing is, is that, again, I said we were the best team in the state. And um, the second day, everybody played on my team, except for our number one golfer. He actually medaled. He was the state champ that year. And everybody else on my team, two through six, I was the sixth golfer my junior, two through six, we all played terribly. Um, but the next day we came back and we, we shot the best score. But as a team, too far. But we back were so far point. behind that we ended up fifth. I believe it was fifth. Um, so we didn't even get uh, top three. So that still hurts. My senior year, we didn't have as good of a team. It was more of a grind. I was the lone senior on the team that year. Um, we had some good young talent, but um, unfortunately, we just we, we 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 ended up middle of the pack again at state. Uh, but outside of golf. I I got to play uh, senior basketball uh, um, with Adam Holeska. Uh, my He was a junior when I was a senior. He played on my team. That's what I like to say. Uh, and he, gosh, he was good. I mean, Adam Holeska, he's been on the podcast, friend of the show. And he's, I think we had him ranked in the top 35. We ranked the top 100 greatest athletes ever from the state of Iowa. Wow. I think we had Holeska in the top 35. And, you know, he's the only guy he never played in an NBA game, but he was on the roster for a full year while he was um, getting healthy. But he was the only guy in that top 35 that didn't have like some form of Olympic medal or or major professional accomplishment because he was so spectacular. Uh, Like I've never seen seen anybody do what he did like on the track and in basketball. And I just I the he was like a secretariat type guy, just a really special athlete. What was yeah, it like it, seeing him? Well, it, it's, you know, when you, you, he walked on the court and you're in practice with him, and he just was so much better. It was a man amongst boys. Um, and, you know, and he was great at baseball. If he wanted to play baseball, oh, yeah. he could play. He was uh, his ju- junior year, I remember. Gosh, it's been so long now. I guess we're getting on 20 years, Tim. Uh, but he said he was going to play football his junior year and he was first team all state preseason and i think he ended up maybe not playing or something but just that's how good he i yeah, mean just him being on the roster gets him on the des moines register yeah pre-season wide receiver team. um he obviously a great wide receiver with that speed if he would have committed to football he would have been very successful um he didn't play his defense wasn't as good mostly because you're afraid of getting hurt uh, when you have basketball, you know, basketball was always going to be the answer right. for him. But um, in practice, the thing about Adam was. You probably was, had to guard him a little bit in practice. Well, so I, I was, I, I I guess you'd say, I'm going to say it in a, the most kind way. I was the scout team man. Director. Oh. I mean, somebody's got to lead the charge for yeah, the so scout I, team. I was wild. Um, I would drive the basketball no matter what the odds were against me. I mean, I had just a hard nose. I would shoot it whenever, which made me really good in practice being pretending to be the best player from the other team. Um, I obviously wasn't that good, but I would create problems just because I was dumb, uh, which prepares the the defense for, for the upcoming game. So seeing Adam, he's really good. I actually have this uh, broken finger here. Oh, I see it from here. Yeah, this is from... Uh, this pinky, I broke it my senior year um, def- in practice. So I was also, when I was playing defense in practice, I was this guy who went all out all the time. You know, I was the 12th guy on the bench. So I was annoying the starters because I, if a ball was coming through the passing lane, I just stick my hand out. I disrupt the play. Um, and that's what caught me there. That same. It's so still I, messed up. I'm oh, looking yeah. at it right now. Yeah, it's still broken. Or, well, it's healed, but it broke real bad. Um, that same practice where I broke my pinky, I kept playing and, uh, I, I went up when Adam was going up for a dunk and I caught a, 
a Haleska elbow in the eye. He's got a black eye that did game two. So I look pretty tough. Um, but one of my favorite things to do was um, I couldn't push Adam. We even played one-on-one, I remember, once before practice, and it didn't go well for me. Uh, but he always had a great work ethic. Smart guy, but worked really hard on top of his talent and and his smarts. So where I felt I could help him the most or help the team the most was during conditioning. So when we'd line up on the lines and start running killers, uh, I'd try and win. There's no way you beat Alaska. Let's just say that as practice went on, I had good conditioning. So I was able to finagle my way into pushing him. Now, when he decided he wanted to beat me, he could. But I was the annoying guy who was always always trying to win conditioning. Right. And if, if you're listening to this now, like Adam Haluska, if you don't know that name or if you haven't looked up the state track records, in, uh, watching him run the 200-meter dash his senior year at Drake Stadium was like watching Secretariat come down mm. the home stretch in the Preakness or whatever the third leg of the Triple Crown is. It was just spectacular because he's like 6'5 yeah. and just so – strong and just you don't see athletes like that come out of the state of Iowa very often and play all the sports like you know Jeff Horner was kind of that way um from Mason City not as big as Adam was but Horner by his senior year was basically only playing basketball and so what I always loved about Haluska is he continued to run track when he didn't really need to and I'm a big track guy and so I I always love that about him. yeah and, and his senior year he won the 100 the 200 the 400 and the long jump yeah he was unbelievable it, it's just great so in and in, in all that athleticism was on in practice um and I always like to say so we were the best team in state that year um, I think we were rated three. Denison was supposed to be rated above us, but big upset. Sub sub our uh, district final. We had to play at the Kemper Gymnasium for some reason. Goes to overtime, and um, we're playing against Denison. and And Adam goes up for this last second three, and he he has like two Denison Monarchs all over. I mean, they are following him. They they're like picking his pocket legitimately. And he somehow throws this ball up, and it goes in, and we end up winning that game. It was fantastic. We ended up, unfortunately, sub-state playing a sub-500 Webster City team. And this was a classic case of we had already moved on to state in our minds. Mm-hmm. After we beat Denison, that was our bit, That was the big challenge. We beat Denison, and we ended up losing by five points to Webster City because— Well, Webster <sighs> City had talent on that team, though, and they play in the— Toughest conference in the state, the North Central Conference, which everybody knows that's way tougher. That was yeah. it, the Hawk 10 that you guys play? Is that we the Raccoon River? The Raccoon River, yeah. Which and gave it's, you, um, it's not even the Hawk 10, no. But we had Adam Maleska and we had a stellar. I mean, our team was so good, but I'll never forget coming in at halftime. Uh, and we were down, which was really unexpected. And we had a sophomore who, who got put in, who was a defensive specialist. This is really in depth. I'm sorry, I haven't talked about this. This is what years. we're here for, Scott. uh, but um. Put him in, uh, coach put him in, and um, unfortunately, um, the sophomore wasn't as good on all the offensive end, and there was a couple turnovers, oh, and boy. we ended up behind. And I knew at halftime the way that we had kind of turned on each other that we weren't winning that game. And what you, you know, now bring it back to being a little bit humorous about me, situ- my situation. Um, after we beat Denison, I started fast and f- uh, fantasizing about. I'm going to get to shoot the basketball in warm-ups at the barn. And we have Adam Aleska, and we win games by, you know, double digits, 20 points easy. I'm going to get to play in the state tournament. And I, I'll tell you what, Tim, in warm-ups, we played at BV, at the BV uh, uh, Arena. I, for, I don't know what exactly it's called, but we played there against Webster City for sub-state. And that place was jam-packed. Oh, yeah. And during warm-ups, I was on fire. <laughs> Okay, and the whole crowd knows they see it, and and I was the the kid that you root for to get in at the oh, end yeah. of the game, right? So we won. Sipker was the chant that would come out, and then I would come onto the floor during the regular season and uh, hopefully give the the crowd what they're looking for, which is a Sipker basket. And I ended up going uh, 0 for five from the three point arc my senior year. I went uh, 0 for two from the free throw line. I was so nervous when I got fouled one time and missed both free throws. Uh, and then I went two for five inside the arc. And uh, those two points, 
there's video out there somewhere. I need to find these VHSs. When I scored that place, you, <laughs> the, the camcorder that was recording, it shakes because it's so loud. People felt so bad for me uh, that, that they felt good for me when I had something go right for me. But, man, it was uh, what a great time. And when we lost that game to, to uh, Webster City, uh, Were there I, tears I, in the locker room? I cried so hard. Yeah. And it took me many years. It sounds pathetic, but it took me many years to get over it. Uh, I'm not, I'm still sad about it because what a missed opportunity. I would have gotten to play or at least even warmed up. Or if we get to state, we, we can win that thing. Oh, we yeah. can win it. And it's just a missed opportunity. And um, the old glory days, uh, when I think about it, still does rankle me. But I was so lucky to be able to get onto that team because my freshman year, I, I played basketball and I ended up uh, then not playing my sophomore year. My junior year, I was the camera guy. And then my senior year, one of the players, Chad Hewton, bet me $20 that I want to go out. So I did. And, uh, <laughs> and they put me with the freshman team to practice uh, the one one of these practices we don't know we were two or three weeks into to to practice they made me practice with the freshman team and just take my lumps um and i think what they're trying to do was get me to quit and i don't quit so i just stuck it out and then the next practice after that uh, coach pulled me aside and said okay, you're gonna be playing with the varsity for the rest of the year nice. um because they had a no cut policy for seniors which is why i got in uh but i did i deserve to be on the team probably not but I let me just be a bit grandiose if this if I haven't already and just say that if basketball was played the way it is now back then I would have got to play cuz I was a three-pointer. I mean I was a three-point specialist back in the day when that wasn't allowed, right? You weren't supposed to jack it up, but I would that's jack true, it up. But are we are are you I mean, you didn't make a three-pointer your senior year. No, that's because I nervous. I was really nervous because I'd only get in at the end. Now, I also have to say, we went undefeated in every game I played, okay? Um, now, we won't look at the box scores for all that. But I'll never forget the very first shot I ever took. I came in late in the game. I, I did a little, got a little screen, had a curl in the, had a corner three, just wa- open up wide. And before I turned around to get the ball, I caught the eyes of my calculus teacher. <laughs> And uh, he was just sitting there. You know how at intimate high school gyms yeah. are. This is the Carroll High gym. He's probably, I don't know, row of three or four. And for some reason, I, I caught eyes. I turn around, I get the ball, and I immediately jack it up. And I was so nervous that I hit the side of the backboard. It was really awkward. But in practice, man, whoo, practice. I will say this. My first shot of a, of a varsity basketball game was very similar. I came off a screen, popped out to the corner, was so nervous that the ball touched my hands and it went up and I airballed it by three feet. <laughs> so like, I'm not going to sit here and criticize yeah. you because it, it, it's happened to me. Mm-hmm. I know the feeling. And what I just love most is that there's, there's nothing better than like high school basketball when you're a high schooler. Oh, it man. is like in front of a packed gym and in everything matters, everything means so much. Mm-hmm. And that's a cool thing. Like I just got done watching the Ben Affleck movie, the the way back. I don't know if you've seen I that one yet. It. It's really good. I, I, I would recommend that one, but you watch, you know, it's a high school basketball movie about California inner city, um, of basketball and some of these bigger cities, you know, the high school games are not a big thing. You know, it's become like AAU is, is a bigger thing and there, and nobody shows up for these high school games. And, and that, that's the way in this movie as well. But when you come to Iowa and you get two teams that are over 500 in towns like Denison or Car- in Carroll or Fort Dodge and Webster City, and you got a hot, sweaty gym on a Friday night, there isn't much better. And how cool is it that it's like 16 and 17 year old kids that get to experience that because that's a level of intensity, nervousness, uh, that you're just not going to find a lot of other places you're for your entire life, mm-hmm. you know, like the intensity that you feel on the court, there's not a lot out there. Oh yeah. At one time coach, I, I had been doing well in practice and again, it sounds like I'm patting myself on the back, but one of the, I started behind the eight ball because I had taken two years off. Okay. And I look like a kid who's just out there because somebody bet him $20, which is sort of true. It's kind of true. Uh, but I did love basketball, and I re- I always I always kept playing because uh, we had the Mount Carmel gym, 
and we the priest would give us the key and we'd play there you know in, in mount carmel till midnight or whatever but i when i when i i got to go in uh we were playing in uh, nevada and coach put me in, in the third quarter and uh, oh, when he called my name i i couldn't believe it because I never heard my name called until, you know, it was late in the fourth. Did you have, like, tearaway pants on? And, uh, like, yeah, so what, we had, what were the warm-ups yeah, looking yeah, like? Yeah, so we had uh, black tearaways. We had the, the team shoe was the Allen Iverson uh, ones, all black. Which uh, So probably the second version of yeah, the, the question gosh. or the answer, one of and those I two? I think it was the answer. And I don't remember if it was the first version or the second version. But it was all black, and it had, like, this crappy plastic on the toe that shined. Uh, which is now just doesn't look very good. I still have the shoes. Though, but back, back then, is this 02? Uh, 01. Uh, 2000 to 2000. Well, I graduated in 01. Yep. So uh, we're, but he puts me in in Nevada and, and the game is competitive at this point. And I'm, I'm so We need nervous. a three, sip curve. Well, here's the thing. This was before being a three point special. So what I would do is I told you earlier, I could, I could, if there was a sliver of light, I would drive the basketball through it. I, I mean, I would find a way to slip into the lane and somehow put up a circus shot. So instead, I remember I got the ball, and I was so nervous because, again, I thought that I, I wasn't stupid then. Uh, I, I knew this was an opportunity for me, and if I did well, this was going to become a regular thing. So I got the ball, and I, I'm, gonna, I'm an aggressive player. So I put the ball on the floor. And I, I get into the lane and I get up there and I'm the the lane totally collapses in on me. But I'm able to do this circus shot where I move the ball around and I I don't know, I did it all the time, but I was able to get it up and then get it off cleanly. And it was a very difficult shot. I remember the ball went off and I thought, Oh my gosh, that is in. And I remember looking up and it went in and it came out. And after that it was just I doghouse. Yeah. Um, because it was, it really was an ill-advised, uh, play. Yeah. I mean, Haluska's on the other wing, future <laughs> NBA player. And you're like, I got to open this to the hole. I got to take it to the hole. So I, I, uh, you know, if that shot goes in, maybe some things are different. Maybe I need to start my own podcast, and interview all of my teammates and see how delusional I actually am. You know, that'd be a good idea. We've had on this podcast, you know, we've had NBA champions, World Series champions, Olympic gold medalists. And I think you speak the most highly of your athletic skill than anyone else we've ever. <laughs> most people are pretty like self-deprecating yeah. or humble. Like you're you're not at all. Yeah. Well, I, I know that I was um, I was just ahead of my time. So I you, was first forced. of all, you're acting like you played. Like in an experimental time where they tried the three point line out in like 1988 for a, a two games or something, like you know the, the three pointer had been around for a while when you played. Yeah, it had been. Yeah, unfortunately, the did it just get to the Raccoon River Conference yeah. in like 2000? Well, it just all these old school coaches. They're all like, uh, just hammer it down low, get it right. to the post. I'm a, I'm six foot guy, okay, and this is how I know I'm good, Tim. Okay, as uh, as why I go to Iowa State. All right. The lead rec center. And yeah, and I go and I I play intramural basketball. Win the championship, leading scorer on my team. Now it was a six foot and under league, but it tells you <laughs> that I was good. Also, we won co ed basketball. Now, uh, granted, uh, we had a friend who was like, how old? Uh, Matt Cook is his name, and he was like, I think he tried to walk onto the basketball team, and he's I don't know six 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 seven or something and could shoot the three and he was on our co-ed team so that made that so you a bring little up bit easier i was state intramurals which are a big deal at i was i was oh, yeah. very proud of their intramural program it might be like the first intramural program or one of these things from iowa state that they're really proud of and they give away these shirts if you win an intramural championship they don't give them away man that you're right what you got to earn That's the shirt right. and my older brother andy in this fall of 2003, won his first shirt by winning the card game, the 500, 500 card sure. game. Yeah, yeah. He won his first intramural shirt. He went on to win maybe a handful more. But he, I was always taken aback by how big of a point of pride it was for Hall's intramural championship shirts. So let's go through your list of intramural championship shirts at Wild yeah, yeah. State. Well, first I'll go through some sad second places. Um, I uh, got second place in the Euchre tournament. 
man, we, me and my uh, partner, Gina, uh, who was my roommate at the time as well, uh, we, God, we were good. We were on fire that day. We went alone a couple times and just nailed it and we got all the way to the, to the final and ended up losing, unfortunately. Um, curling is still one that hurts Ooh. really, really bad. I was a skipper on the team, which for people don't know curling, that's the person who goes last. We've had captain. John Schuster on the pod, by the way. So you know about curling. And um, I'll never forget, we were playing out there at the, at the arena, and it actually goes into overtime for the championship. And uh, they'd, I don't think they expected this. The officials did. So they uh, just had us do like a, a, a push-off. Um, to both one skipper versus one skipper, one stone, push it down. Um, and I'll never forget. I went second and I, when I released it, it, it I thought, Oh my gosh, this, this is, this is going to be close. <laughs> and, uh, I got down there. And I'll never forget, you know, it's pretty far down there. And I remember I thought it had stopped. The stone had stopped. And then it just kind of did like a, I don't know, a three degree turn and it kind of moved a little bit and we went down it got the measuring tape out and we ended up losing by a quarter of an inch that's what happens when you're not using your own stones yes yeah, thank you you know what i mean you that's bring your own stones happened. i should and, and you you release a perfect stone yeah and it ends the way you expect but when you're using you know the iowa state and who knows about yeah, the stones that they're bringing knows? in there and the guy i was going up against was probably on steroids uh, so i ended up losing by a quarter of an inch and I remember that night I, I I just ran through campus. I was so mad. I was just so mad. But anyway, to the successes. Um I won uh six foot and under basketball. I won um I should say, probably say we. Uh my team won yeah. uh, six foot and under basketball. We I'm not won, that type of podcast. Here. Yeah. <laughs> we or at least I'm not that type of person. Uh uh co ed basketball, co ed softball, and uh ping pong. Ended up winning Ooh. individually on ping pong. Um, and it was, gosh, intramurals were so, they're so much fun. I played so many of them. for, And it's one of the best parts of being an Iowa State student. So you won ping pong. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, I always thought I was a pretty good ping pong player. I still think I'm a pretty good ping pong player. Um, but I got to college and I started playing some of the Asian guys in college. And I realized there's a whole nother level of ping pong. You know, people that have come from the Asian part of the world that play table tennis, like from the moment they get out of the womb, like it's a big sport over there. It's kind of like Americans trying to play soccer, you know, against against yeah. people it's from other parts culture. of the world. Like, yeah, or like Europeans coming over here and trying to play us in baseball. Like you might be pretty good in England, but it's different here. Yeah, uh, I found that out with table tennis and, and ping pong. I just got I got my ass handed to me yeah. against like basically every Asian guy I played in, in college. We didn't, I never played until I got to college, and then I lived in uh, Helzer Hall. Uh, oh, my brother lived in Helzer Hall. Oh, yeah? Which floor? Um, I have no idea. Okay, well, I lived in uh, Livingston, third floor, strong floor. And um, we had just, it was I, just the, probably the best two years of my life. You just can't replicate that fun that we we'll had. Sure and we, your wife knows. Yeah, oh, I've told her many times, and she understands. Uh, but uh, it's... We had a ping pong table in the in the lobby or in the den, and uh, it just so happens that we happened to have a guy who was from Pella who was ranked on the world rankings, uh, and we had other guys who were really good, and I just picked up the game there, and I um, ended up uh, uh, like the standard grip didn't quite work for me, so I switched to Japanese penholder style, uh -huh. and it just opened up the game for me. And I, oh, Tim, it was so great. We, that ping pong was so big on my dorm floor that we got to the point we, we'd be playing every night till late in the morning, but we got to the point where we had put a tournament together. And when it came down to the championship, the whole den was just filled standing room only with people watching. There was, there's like glass on the outside separating the hallway, people on the outside watching this ping pong match uh, between the two best players on our floor. We had enter entrance music, people with, uh, you know, enter with hoods on and their yeah. earbuds on, you know, when they're is, headphones, like, yeah, headphones. Yeah. Headphones. Cause there weren't really earbuds. In. And, uh, and it was such a big deal. Um, and sports were such a big part of Livingston that we actually, we had a really good football team too. So we would play 11 on 11 tackle football. 
against other floors in Helzer. Really? And we ended up beating everybody. And then we ended up playing floors in Friley. Um, and eventually they had to put an all-star team together, Livingston versus the all-stars. And we beat them. Um, and so much so that one of my teammates uh, said, and I'm going to choose to believe him, that he was riding the side ride once and he overheard somebody say that they think that this Livingston dorm team could compete against the Iowa State team. Oh, my God. And we Here were, we go. We were so we, – and the reason we were so good uh, was that – we had our offensive line averaged probably 280 pounds. We had a couple guys over 300, uh, and it was just we we could manhandle people. And our second year, we just so happened to have a walk-on quarterback uh, who ended up not uh, dropping out of the team. Be on our floor. Who is that? I uh, can't remember his name because he ended up transferring like mid semester to go to UNO. To be a quarterback there. Oh, was he I from Nebraska, though? Um, he might have been. I don't remember. But I was uh, uh, our leading wide receiver. And I never, you know, we had guys, we had a guy who played high school. Uh, he was a high school quarterback, and he was good, Scott Tinkoff. Um, he got usurped by this other guy. I wish I could remember his name. But catching a ball from this college quarterback right. was, I'd never seen anything before. I would just I'd go down, maybe do a, a quick hitch and go and beat the the cornerback. And I would turn around and I'd just put my hands out and the ball would be there. <laughs> and I was like, what, what happened? Um, you know, I don't recommend playing 11, 11 tackle football. Cause we did have some concussions. We had a uh, guy blow out his AC or his uh, Achilles. Hmm. Uh, so the ambulance had to come, but we played on the, where the, uh, the banded practice. Now there's a how hall I think is over top of that, but it's, we had so oh, much man. fun playing this tackle football it was and it was such a big deal it was such a big deal we we would have people come and watch we'd run plays we only gave up two points the whole time and that was because we decided to run a draw on our own one yard line and we ended up getting tackled for safety so what i love watching you get excited about this because i get excited about (laughs) stuff like this and people think i'm crazy for it but that's what makes sports fun like you and i could go out and play golf or you and i could play one-on-one ping pong or or one-on-one basketball or something we'd be into it because we love Mm -hmm. sports but what's all what makes sports even more fun is when everybody else involved cares just as much as you do like i can't play co-ed sports because most of the times the females females don't care Mm -hmm. as much as the guys do and so it's hard for me because if i compete in something i want to compete against somebody that want to wants to beat me and i want to beat them and i want to be guys on my team that that care just as much as i do and what you're describing is situations where everybody cared just as much as you did and that's what makes things fun yeah and in my co-ed experience was it was different than that i mean the the women on our team were great and their tenacity their their desire to win sometimes made me uncomfortable because it was like (laughs) <laughs> on a scale of one to ten, how sexist was my comment about co-ed sports? Oh, I, I, I mean, I suppose it depends on. Uh, I don't know how how you, have, well you, you meant my it. Experiences, uh, yeah, I, no, it wasn't meant to be sexist. Yeah, yeah, I guess yeah, it was no, just no, based just on my your experience. your experience. Like, yeah, I, I mean, I've certainly had. We had guys on our flag football team who were not all that into yeah. it, right? My wife's uh, terrified of me. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I'm terrified of you as well. <laughs> uh, but it's, you know, it's just one of those things that. When somebody, when people are involved and really committed to it, there's a fine line. Like you can, you can take it too far, and 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 that that fine line is is there. But you know, I think to now even to my present life, I mean, and I probably get so excited talking about these things that I haven't talked about them hardly at all over the last twenty years, and the memories are kind of coming back to me. But I. Now, currently, the the thing that I have, the touchstone to that moment in my life is uh, every year we have for now seven or eight years, we have a Ryder Cup uh, back in Carroll between the Kemper Alumni Golfers and the Carroll High Alumni Golfers. We call it the Rivalry Cup. It's actually this coming weekend oh uh, is God. the eighth installment, I believe, in Carroll High. We finally won again last year. But the first couple years of that, and I'll just speak sec- about the second year. Um, you know, you, in a Ryder Cup, you, you play alternate shot, you play best ball, uh, you play your own ball, so on and so forth. In, in, in our, and then in the end, you end up playing singles, mono e mono right. for a point. Well, I'm the only person 
uh, and you know, there's about 50 guys on each team, ebbs and flows. 50 guys on yeah. each team? This is so, a big deal. Big deal. Um, now it's it's down this year, of course, because of everything, because we're socially distancing the the uh, the uh, tournament this year, so we have fewer guys. But it, that second year, uh, I don't know, there was either fifty or sixty guys on each squad. The only person who had a brother who played on the other side was me. Me and my brother, my my Your brother Nick Kemper went to Kemper. I went to Carroll High. Oh, I like this guy. So my he's a terrible person. Uh, so it, they decide to put me and my brother in the final group, okay, of this Ryder Cup, this rivalry cup, um, and it comes down to me and my brother on the last hole to decide who wins this thing. And there is everybody is following us around, and I have never in my life I felt pressure in my life. I've I've. Uh, performed in front of 18,000 people uh, where and all national news cameras where if I mess up, it's going to brand me forever. That pressure didn't compare to what I felt coming down that 18th hole. Um, and it came down to me and my brother uh, to win this thing. And I ended up having uh, a putt to win. And it was the longest putt I've ever had. It was only a couple feet, but it felt like 20. Mm -hmm. And the pressure, it felt like there were slabs of concrete on my chest. And when I made that putt, uh, the place, it was just, I I can't, the investment there, right? It was just amazing because we all really want to win. We all want to win. We always want to shove it down Kimber's throat. Um, And it was one of the highlights of my life. Also, uh, Still one of the terrifying things because I will still at this moment spend six or so years ago, I will sometimes have it flash over me. What if I miss that? Oh, yeah. What if I miss that putt? That's where you can go into a dark place. Oh, and I do go there. That's that's when you have like three glasses of Templeton Rye and it's like, man, if I miss that putt, it changes the whole direction of yeah. my life. It, yeah, and it could have. The problem, the, what made it even worse, and I'll try and get off of this, is that I ended up going up three holes on my brother in the first four holes. I'm up three. And I remember telling my caddy, I go, man, I, I feel bad. I wish my brother would play a little well. Oh, yeah. And then I got the shanks. And my brother comes back. I have the shanks Scott, on the 18th never hole. never give an inch. I know. So they, This is why we're, it's gl- good that the Last Dance documentary came out <laughs> because it taught us all that you can never... You can never give an inch. That's what Michael Jordan has taught us all, is yeah. that, is that the moment you start feeling bad for your brother, Dan, after you're up three, four holes into it, is the moment Dan starts coming back on you, and you start losing your edge, Scott. I mean, is your brother's name Dan? Isn't, isn't your brother's oh, name Oh, no, Dan? my name is his Nick, but I thought you maybe, oh. you had a little Freudian slip there, and you... I thought, I thought his name was Dan. No, my uncle's name is Dan, and he's my pickleball partner, Oh, and I yelled at him recently, so that <laughs> may be the Freudian slip part of it. Okay. Yeah, so maybe Tim, uh, we are on different levels. Uh, it seems like maybe. Do you, do you see a therapist? Uh, well, I, I have. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. I, mean, I, I continue. I would encourage you to continue to do that. <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, I do. I have for years. See one. I have actually Thursday is my next appointment. So yeah, I mean, I I've, I was seeing a therapist for a while there, and then you know you think you're really good. It's like man, don't need to see that therapist anymore. And then all of a sudden. You know, you start your own podcast and you start talking about high school sports for a couple of years and you're like, and you're like oh, no, man, I need to get back <laughs> seeing that therapist. If I well, if they just were to play basketball differently, I could have been an MVP. Right. I could have been a champ. You know, your Webster City game that you talk oh, about from 01 is my brain and Myers game. 2004 state championship, double overtime, St. Emmanuel Gales versus PCM. I won't say that like like I'm over that game. We we played a good game and we lost to you know a, a, a very re- respected opponent. But I think about that game often. You know. Yeah. You gotta let it. And, and you yeah. There's things that you 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 come to terms with, and and then they go away. And there's other things you come to terms with and you carry them with you. And in, in part, you know, I say it somewhat tongue in cheek about you know not being over the high school uh, heartbreak, but. Man, just there is a missed opportunity there. And it does, you know, to bring it back around to currently, I feel awful for all those kids who lost their senior years or lost their juniors or lost oh, any yeah. season this year because of COVID. And that just because the memories that you make then um, can be so informative into the person that you'll become or the person you want to avoid to become. Um, and the joy it can bring, it's just, well, either way, right. The highs and the lows, they both matter. And that's what high school sports is about. It's about learning from losing and it's about learning from winning. And it's about learning when you try 
abandon the team and go alone and that doesn't work out and you learn and 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 when you work with the team um like all that stuff is about learning and yeah did we lose to webster city and it still burns me today yeah but i but having that sense of loss um it it, it's uh, informative and uh, to how how to to act as an adult when you when true loss comes about oh man Okay. Well, well, that, wraps, well, up our, yeah, okay. that wraps up our <laughs> Sorry first <about> segment. <laughs> so uh, we've—I was not expecting to go that long on your athletic career because I had no idea how highly you thought <laughs> of your athletic <laughs> prowess. Yeah, would have been so good. Let's move on to to your acting career. Oh yeah. Um, so most notably, you are most famous for being the Iowa nice guy, which yeah. was like one of the greatest characters you know, YouTube has ever given us is, is the Iowa nice guy. And what was surprising to me after I, you know, did a Scott Sipker Google search five years ago, um, was that you're an Iowa state grad. And yet if you watch all the Iowa nice guy stuff, like it's very Hawkeye centric, even the, the political stuff that you've done, it feels like I bet this guy went to Iowa. Mm. And so when I found out that you went to Iowa state, it, it surprised me a little bit. So are you a Hawk fan or, or well, how did yeah, the, how yeah, did the first I, University of Iowa connection come into this? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm interested that you think that I, because we've done, you know, it's been, I think six years since we did the last Iowa nice guy video, which was Cy nice, which was a follow-up to Herky nice, which was a follow-up to when we did Hawkeye nice and cyclone nice. Um, and I, I guess I tried, and when we did everything on ESPN, you know, we, I think we talked about Iowa and Iowa State each time. Um, so it's interesting that you, that you see it that way. Well, I mean, now, the, the, the Nebraska stuff stuck. Sure. And I think at the, so yeah, Nebraska had, they just switched over to the big 10. What year did they switch over to the big 10? God, I can't remember. I can't but remember, it around that time. It, but they were in the big 10 when you yeah. were doing it. So that, yeah, I could see. Yeah. Cause that could certainly slant it that way. Um, and when Iowa went, had that undefeated season, we did a couple of sketches that were even not necessarily Iowa nice guy stuff that were always Iowa centric. Uh, we were, you know, uh, right in that wave. Because uh, talk to your kids about the SEC myth is still oh, yeah. the second most watched video we've ever had besides Iowa nice. Um, and that certainly is a, a Hawkeye centric. But, you know, maybe there that bias has come out. So my story is that I grew up in a house uh, that was very welcoming of both Iowa and Iowa State. My my dad went to the first game at Jack Trice Stadium uh, with my uncle. Uh, he had Iowa State shirts, um, but he was a Hawkeye fan. And again, he rooted for Iowa State, but this was in the time when Iowa won every single time. Right. It was a lot easier to be a fan of of both teams, I yes. guess, or when they're not playing each other, right, we cheer right. for both. And, but like that doesn't exist yeah. anymore. And in the 80s, that that's... You know, and so my dad the Walden was era cyclones. Yeah, very much, very much um, liked both. But we were a hot Hayden Fry. He's on Saturday yeah, afternoons, and, and and you know, is you know that I was raised by what you would call, I suppose, derisively by two tavern hawks. Um, you know, neither of my parents went to to, to college. Uh, my dad barely made it out of high school, uh, and uh, that's you know both blue collar. Oh, workers and and being a Hawkeye fan was part of the identity of the state at the time. So I grew up a big Hawkeye fan. Ended up deciding to go to Iowa State and uh, became a Cyclone fan there. Where and I was a huge Cyclone fan. My first uh, appearance on ESPN before the Iowa Nice Guy was me with my shirt off, painted uh, <laughs> at Hilton Coliseum. Uh, we would go to when I, I talked about Livingston earlier. We would get in line at six in the morning to get the front row at Jack Trice Stadium for those games. I was on the field uh, before the whistle had blown at that Texas Tech game with the run oh, of yeah. Seneca's Seneca one. Wallace. I was on the field with my roommate Colin Dotson. We had thought we got so excited. We once the we saw the clock go zero zero zero. We ran onto the field. Well, of course, we know in football that the play doesn't stop at that point. Uh, so we were on the field. I'd love to see the that footage. I'd never seen it. I was trampled during the, after the Nebraska game when we charged the field, and my glasses got knocked out, knocked off of me, and I was down under a heap of people, and it was totally black. and And somebody pulled me up uh, by my 
by my shirt and I didn't see who it was and they handed me my glasses and I'm I to this day I say it was Seneca Walsh. Now strangely my life has turned a course where Seneca Walsh is my friend now. Hey-o. So uh it turns out it wasn't him because I've run this story by him he says it wasn't him. Uh but I became this Iowa State fan uh through all these experiences and absolutely loved it and that got into my blood too. And so I haven't been able to shake being raised a Hawkeye fan and becoming a Cyclone fan. It's the Cyhawk weeks are very uncomfortable for me. I don't want them to go away like they have this year uh, because I've seen the positivity that Cyhawk week brings to the vast majority of people when we go on RVTV. Uh, but I am I am legitimately uh, a Hawkeye and a Cyclone fan, and I know people hate that and they don't believe me, but it is absolutely true. So <clears throat> you you mentioned the ESPN thing earlier because that's kind of where the Iowa Nice Guy really blew up is these ESPN things, and they were great. Like, so many of them were so fun. Before having you on, I went back and, and watched most of them, and they're just so well-written. Your delivery was great. It seemed like, you know, that character was perfect for you. How did that ESPN relationship come about? So when we put out the first Iowa Nice, it was written by my good friend and still uh, film collaborator, uh, Paul Benedict. And uh, he sent that to me when I was working at Wells Fargo. And I still remember I was sitting at this Hawthorne building uh, and my cube and I opened up this script and I read it and I started crying. I was laughing so hard. I was laughing. So can I swear on the podcast? Yeah, okay. swear on the podcast. So when I first read that line, so I hear you think you know something about Iowa, fuck you. <laughs> I thought, what in the world? And then when it gets to the end and, and it ends with uh, the fuckwad line, uh, but then it has the false ending and you come back on and it talks about the computer. Uh, it's just, I, I, I was laughing so hard. So Paul and I um, went out and we filmed it. Paul ran the camera and uh, and, and so he directed it. And I, I'm, I'm kind of stepping back here just to, to talk about how the character came about. So we didn't really know what we were doing. It wasn't called Iowa Nice. There was no Iowa Nice guy character. The script was just uh, the writing program that we used at the time, uh, uh, Celtics, uh, which is a f- free script writing program. If anybody wants to use it, just go to C E L T X.com and you can use it for free. Um, we we've now upgraded to a paid program, but nevertheless, but at the time we used, so the program just automated the title to being the first line of it. So it was, uh, so you think, you know, dot, dot, dot. Um, so we get out and we start filming. And it was really cold. Shot on December 31st was the first day we shot. And it was really cold. We were outside of the Royal Mile or Java Joe's where there was a CN or a MSNBC truck or there was a, there was a media truck there, a national media truck because the caucuses were there. And I didn't really have a take on it at that point. It really wasn't going to be something that was dry. I was just going to deliver it the way that I talk now, which is more animated, you know, goofy, yeah. right? But then I got, I did it maybe two takes and it, it was fine. But I was just, I remember this time, and I, I think I said to Paul, I go, let me try something. And I, I kept that same smile on the beginning of it. I go, so I hear you think you know something about Iowa. And then I just let my jaw relax and go totally deadpan. And I just drop kind of the cadence, register of my voice. I go, fuck you. <laughs> and like something clicked in that. I will never forget the sensation that I felt when I relaxed my jaw muscle. I know it seems so esoteric, but uh, but that's that myopicness is that a word? Myopicness. Just all of a sudden, that character was born in that relaxation. I can, I can like you just visualize it. it now. Like oh, boom! That's the character, and that was the first line we did. Luckily, we shot in chronological order, which is not normally the case. Uh, and so, I, I had this character. Now it was like boom, there it is. So, or I should have said whoop, there it is. But we went around and we filmed. Uh, uh, the rest of that day, we took a break to party for New Year's Eve, got up a little hungover, finished filming on January 1st, and put it together, and the the, the character was there um, at that point. Um, we had filmed with, because it was cold, I had a, a dark overcoat. Uh, we had ended up needing to film inside for the uh, uh, Angel Food Cake line. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so for that, we decided, well, let's lean into this kind of uh, dry, dark character, and so we dressed him in a dark suit, dark black tie, shirt, black, black shirt, tie, yep. and um, 
And that just worked. Now, as we, we eventually came to answer your question about that. So we have this character that is dark and we filmed it dark. If you go back and watch the original Iowa Nice, we, we filmed that inside space pretty dark, darkly lit, um, which isn't actually good for broadcast television. So we eventually come around after we do Iowa Nice, we do Hawkeye Nice and Cyclone Nice. And the way that had come about is we were pretty much like, we're going to be done with that Iowa Nice thing. We're done. We're moving on. So we actually ended up spinning that uh, notoriety. Well, I guess it wasn't notoriety because that's ne- negative, but uh, that fame a bit for a Kickstarter campaign to do a pilot about two actors from the coast who get stuck in Iowa during the tax film credit scandal called Marooned. And so I had come up with this idea and written the script and we shot the pilot for $2,000. And really, honestly, if it was shot in LA, it'd be a $200,000 project or more. Um, so we were able to to shoot this and I'm still proud of it, but we put out this pilot and we just didn't, at that point, we didn't have the profile or the platform to get, um, you know, a network or a distributor to be interested in it. So that was really disappointing because I still really believe in that project. Um, well, that is eight years ago now. But anyway, so we eventually, I came up with the idea of spinning away from politics like the original Iowa Nice was and getting into sports, which is something that I knew really well, but Paul, my co-writer, didn't really know. So we ended up bringing on a guy named Nick Rankowski, who's the funniest person that I know, and um, super smart guy. And uh, so we ended up writing on these Iowa Nice and Cyclone Nice scripts. And the idea I had was, to make this go viral was let's make fun of every school in the Big Ten and the Big 12. So we did. Each of those videos ends with me doing a one-liner against every school and Nebraska twice right? uh, because it's so easy. So um, we put those out, and they do really well, and we get just through our YouTube channel had ESPN reach out to us. Uh, Baron Miller was his name. And he said, hey, can we play these on our air? And I'm skipping over a lot of the story because I know I'm bloviating, but um, he put those on our air. Uh, are on his air on ESPN News, College Football Daily. They went over really well. He came back and asked if we'd do original college football comedy content. We agreed, of course, and uh, we ended up doing two seasons of that. Yeah, so that's how it happened. It was just through an email or a YouTube message and then picked up the phone and we negotiated and we figured it out. Does Is that character one that you identify most with? Because that's kind of been, you know, Scott Sipker, Iowa Nice Guy. Yeah. Like that is kind of almost your tagline yeah. at this point. It's what people know you for. But outside of like what people know you for, is that what you, you want to be known for? Is that how you think of yourself? I am. And whenever this topic comes up and I appreciate you indulging me in it. Cause I, I do understand how pretentious it sounds. Um, I'm totally fine with people calling me the Iowa nice guy. I'm, I've, I've been able to have a really nice career because of it. I, I love that it happened. It changed my life. I have, uh, I'm very, uh, I'm fortunate to have had uh, been able to leave I, uh, Wells Fargo and be, you know, an, a working actor in Iowa and have a house and um, it, to be debt free and all that sort of jazz. It's been great. But the Iowa Nice Guy, it, and I think people know this if they've come to listen to the Murph and Andy show is that the Iowa Nice Guy is different than me. Right. The Iowa Nice Guy is not a very nice person. He's a jerk. <laughs> he uh, is very vulgar. Uh, he's foul-mouthed. He's just he's not somebody that you'd want to keep company with, frankly. Yeah, kind uh, of abrasive. Yeah, he's, he's really, he's a mean person. He's mean-spirited. He says things that I wouldn't say about people. You know, he, he makes fun of people's... Uh, Drug addictions, like what we did uh, with um, Bo Pelini's brother, right. like that, that's something I wouldn't do. Right. Um, and and maybe even now, I don't know if we'd write that character to do that. Maybe we would, but uh, the Iowa Nice Guy is just—he's a part of my personality, I suppose you would say. But I had to very early on when people started asking me to come and give speeches, I had to very quickly figure out a way to tell them that the Iowa Nice Guy wasn't showing up because if he did. Yeah. He would essentially, he'd get up there, he'd say, hey, uh, this place is paying me a lot of money, and I just want to tell you, all you people here, uh, fuck you, and bye. 
and people would laugh at it, right? Because it's so antithetical to what's supposed to happen. Right. But that's not how you, you can't do that to people. You can't do that to people. So I had to bring my own self, a, a, a more kind of a, a more animated version of myself to that type of thing. And I am an actor at heart and um, I'm much more, I, I to kind of get back to you. You brought up um, the Man in Brown from Valentine Road from earlier, and playing the villain is what I want to do. I I prefer drama over comedy tenfold. Uh, and the Iowa Nice Guy is a villain, and I love playing him. So, do you? Is there any part of you that thinks because the Iowa Nice Guy hit pretty early on that it kind of it's it it kept you in Iowa? Because it became part of you, but you're you're a very talented actor. You're you're a filmmaker, a writer, a director. Like you've done all producer, all these things. Like you have an IMDb page. With oh a bunch yeah, of credits Boy, on I it, haven't you know? looked at that for but a while. Like, other if 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 that doesn't hit, does Scott Sipker move to L.A. or move to move to New York, try to make Broadway or try to make L.A. If you're not the Iowa Ice guy, so the answer is is no. Uh, most likely, who who really knows? But no, um, actually. Uh, after I had left LSU where I did acting, some acting grad school, came back to Des Moines, and that was actually when the tax film credits were going on. So I actually came back from Baton Rouge and was working as a professional actor here. It was great. Um, but shortly within like, I don't know, a month or six weeks is when it all fell apart and that shut down. And at that time, I had a decision to make. Am I going to leave or not? And independently and together, uh, had these thoughts with, uh, Paul, uh, who I had mentioned and my friend, Brendan Dunphy that, you know what, let's enact a plan. Let's, instead of leaving pioneer a new era of filmmaking where you can be in a small market and make it happen. So we set out to prove that you could take a local brand and make it national. And we thought, that that was going to be Valentine Road. We had set out to use Iowa as a trampoline to get us known on a national stage or an international stage and an international stage. Um, and so we did this script that had no talking on it, and it was called Eye of the Storm, and eventually you can go online and see it. I'm still really proud of it. We didn't have any really much equipment at all, and we filmed this thing that became Valentine Road. So we were on this path of we're going to prove that Iowa is a place, even without the tax credits, that you can be an actor and a filmmaker and make it happen. So we set out to do that. A Valentine Road turned out to be a proof of concept that didn't prove its concept yet. Uh, I say yet, hopefully. Um, and that Iowa Nice did prove to be that. So I'm very proud of the fact that Iowa Nice, sure, it, in a way it has a fluky inherency inside of it, but it was a plan that I, I wanted to stay in Iowa and prove that Iowa is a place that a filmmaker and an actor can live and thrive. And I'm very proud that I am still here and I am making a living still being a filmmaker and an actor. So that, that's a long-winded answer to say no. I like that. And I like that you're proud of Iowa and I like that you're, you're you know, committed to making it work here in the state. I think that's really cool. I, you know... I think sometimes people, when they leave Iowa, it's like to prove a point, right? If you, I want to, I'm going to move to LA or I'm going to move to New York. I'm going to move to Dallas or wherever it is. Right. And part of it is like, uh, just to say, you know, I'm, I'm in LA doing it in LA. Like that's a big deal or something. And I think eventually people come around and realize that like, just because you live somewhere else doesn't mean you're you've made it or yeah. or there's something better about where you're doing it there as here. I think the older you get the the more you realize that. But as somebody that's young, right, when you're in your early 20s, that becomes a thing. You think making it is moving away. You think that's that's the goal. And, yeah. and really that's just the beginning. And and in my industry, to be fair, that has always been the case. You have always had to go to the coast to make it happen. And Is it more so now today than it used to be or less so? I Most of the opportunities are still on the coast. We'll, we'll see what happens with COVID and if that changes a uh, formula here or there. But, you know, film is in 
Los Angeles. Theater is in New York and to a lesser degree in Chicago. Yeah, like casting people need to that's see where you they and are. know that's you. That's right. So, um, and I have anybody who's moved, I have many friends who have moved to one of those two markets, most who have not made it. Uh, m- when I, I talk to them, you know, you can see that those cities take it out of you. Mm-hmm. I have had friends who have made it. Uh, Jefferson White is, 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 um, a guy who we had actually cast in Valentine Road in the pilot uh, and has gone on now to have a great career being um, on many different shows, including House of Cards and now most recently. And he does such a damn good job in um, Yellowstone. Uh, oh. And Jefferson is, or I just call him Jeff. I think he goes by Jefferson White. But Jeff is a great person who, you know, went to Iowa State and did theater with and all that jazz. But um, it, it's... There are give and takes whether you go to the coast or you stay here. One of the things if you go to the coast is you can make it faster. Here it's a slower, deliberate process. My process has been let's see if we can prove we can go to be on a national platform from a local place. Um, We've done that on many occasions. And now the next step is getting our documentaries off the ground, which we have some uh, coming out one about Niall Kinnick, and then hopefully we'll complete the one about Jack Trice. So that's our foray into we've proven we can do two-minute videos that get noted. Uh, Now we need to get noted on doing a 90-minute or two-hour, a feature length, let's just say a feature length project, and then hopefully we can spin that into other scripts that we have already written. So um, process, you know, if I went to Los Angeles, and if I would have moved to Los Angeles instead or stayed in New Orleans, where uh, Louisiana has a great tax credit program. So Louisiana actually, at the time I was there, had the third best filmmaking industry that there was. So I probably would have just stayed there and been in B-movies or got on to NCIS New Orleans or whatever. That Would would that have worked? Maybe. You, you and Scott Bakula would be buds. And oh my gosh, Scott Bakula, I was a Quantum Leap fan growing up, so that is still something I want to do is work my way onto that set. Uh, and Tom Arnold, who is great, uh, very, I'm just lucky he's become a friend of mine, has been on that show as a recurring character, so I'm going to try and work that angle at some point. But um, I'm still, I still want to prove that if you surround yourself with Iowans, they will let you stand on their shoulders and you'll get your dreams to come true. Uh, I'm on that path. There are many Iowans who aren't here and have been successful. Ashton is, Ashton Kutcher has been successful. I talked about Jeff on, you know, and obviously there's, there's so many uh, that we could go on a long, long list, January Jones and, and whatnot. Uh, but, I want to be the first one who makes it, Jason Momoa, of course. Uh, I want to be the first Iowan who makes it from Iowa. And I mean that from, like, I am living in Iowa and I make it. Yeah, Frank Sinatra said, if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere about New York City. And I always thought that was kind of like, the, it's the opposite of that. It's like, if you can make it from somewhere else that isn't New York City or L.A., you can make it anywhere because it's harder to make it when you're not in New York city or, or, or Los Angeles. And that's kind of what, what you've just described, Scott. And I know we're kind of up against it right now. You got to go pick up the wife here in a, in a little bit. Yeah. Uh, but we, we got do, some time. We do have, uh, some questions left, Scott. Yeah, so, please, uh, please. Let's, and I just want to compliment you on that because I'm that what you just said about Sinatra and I, the rat pack is I'm, Love the Rat Pack. I'm more Dean Martin guy than Frank, but I love Frank as well. That's because you're a Templeton you, Rye guy. I guess so. What you just said, though, is something I'm going to steal and not give you credit for. Because sure. if you if you can make it here, you, I, I suppose I should talk to my friends who live in New York. They might actually disagree uh, because it would be very hard to win. But there is something about coming from a small market that's not known for a certain thing and making it happen. Yeah, it's like if you can make it as a banker in Iowa, sure. You know, no different because the industries translate. But to your point, like the film industry and TV industry, entertainment is so driven off of tax credits. You've mentioned tax credits five or six different times already. We've seen in Atlanta, New Orleans, like they're trying to um, spur their local economy by having tax credits for certain things. And if you can make a career out of it where the tax credits and, and the economy isn't geared for that, it really proves it's more of an uphill battle. Yeah, it, yeah, it's a, it's a definitely a different battle, and I, 
I, yeah, there's certainly, I know there's a lot of challenges in both LA and New York. For one, if I moved to LA right now, Tim, there are, there are literally 10,000 people just like me, beard, glasses, receding hairline, white dude, skinny frame. Like that, that's, that's that I would be up against it. The thing that yeah, I you want go to, in and they're like Nick Offerman. We we got next. This so what I'm trying to do is make a name for myself. That I'm trying to do such good work here in Iowa that I it's unavoidable. I'm unavoidable to them to out there on the coast, and so I can make a name for myself here. Use Iowa as a trampoline and um, and get so high up there. I'm really belaboring this metaphor, but that people will just be like. Oh, well, that person has proven they can do it. They're successful. Let's, l- here's the money to make that next project. What is the dream role? I will ask a follow up question stage or screen? So I think it's interesting that you separate those two things. You know, uh, like Ben Ollers, we had on this show, has done. Uh, off Broadway stuff with like Matthew Broderick and now he's got stuff coming up with HBO and and he talked about the difference between the two which was new to me because I'm I'm not in that world of course I was the lead in Damn Yankees in 2004 but it's not something we we talk about often (laughs) Um, so I'm gonna say screen because it's more consumable for me Yes. So when it comes to screen, it's a little more difficult because probably my dream role is one that doesn't exist yet. Like it would be a new, new character that that you have written that well, or somebody else has written. uh, And, you know, Sorkin wrote this amazing character and there I am uh, uh, being able to play it. But if, if I, if I'm going to pick like, um, if I'm going to be honest about myself, who I am as a person, you know, I would love to be Batman, but I am not a Batman. I'm just never, nobody is ever going to believe me as a Bruce Wayne. Like, um, you know, Michael Keaton, I think, is the best Batman. And he's as close to my type as as a Batman will ever get. Mm-hmm. So if, if I'm going to be realistic about it. I, I bring up Batman because my dream role is the Riddler. I, I feel like the Riddler has never been done... Um, I don't want to say correctly. The Riddler has never been done the way that I want to do it. And that way is maybe indescribable. Uh, But I just feel like the Riddler hasn't quite been given. This is what I should say. The Riddler hasn't been given the treatment. I think his neuroses deserves. Who got closest with the Riddler? I, 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 I you know, Jim Carrey's Riddler is so out there and so what you what and Jim Carrey did a good job and that script is not it's just not the best. Um I'd love to see Jim Carrey tackle it now. But if, if I were to go with a tone of like uh with um it would be very the Riddler is very different than the Joker. But it, you know you look at how uh, they approached the Joaquin Phoenix uh, Joker from this past year. That's, again, it doesn't quite translate, but it gives you a sense of that type of derangement that the Riddler is. The Riddler clearly wants to be caught. Like, that's what he wants more than anything in the world. He wants to be caught. Right, he's leaving clues to him, back to Absolutely. himself. Absolutely. And he's always kind of been given this kind of um, goofiness to him. And, and, and while and that he's might... Sec- and he's like a secondary villain. Yeah, yeah. He's never and, been like the main villain. But he is a person who is obsessed with two things, being caught and figuring out who Batman is. That's like his whole ethos at at when you when you come to him now what his backstory is and all that sort of jazz um you know i'd love to get into but there's just a there's something about the riddler i feel has never been portrayed and i would love to be able to bring that to the screen now the riddler will be in the new batman movie with the robert pattinson along with the penguin and i think the jokers are there's going to be a whole host of of villains in there but the, the 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 riddler is just somebody who's always been really intriguing to me 
and would be my cinematic dream role. Is there anything that you would not do on screen? So, for instance, I if I were an actor, which I guess I did Damn Yankees and yeah, some other things yeah. at St. Edmund, on the St. Edmund stage, um, I would not do nudity. I would not show, you know, f- full frontal. I'd probably show my butt, mm-hmm. you know, in a walk away, sure. you know, sexy thing. Uh, probably do that. But um, is there anything that you would not do? Uh, I wouldn't do anything illegal. <laughs> uh, well, that's not true. It depends on what state you're in, I suppose. If you have to smoke uh, some marijuana, uh, I might be able to get away with it. But uh, I, you know, if it's if it's moral and ethical and it's done within the context of serving a story, then I, I have no problem uh, doing whatever the character would do authentically in the world that the screenwriter had created. Um, I have, I've never done full frontal nudity. Uh, I have been on stage with full frontal nudity. Uh, uh, actually, on stage? Yeah, yeah, at the uh, Des Moines Playhouse. Actually, the only time there's been full frontal nudity. Uh, and it was when we, I was in The Graduate. I played the ben- Benjamin Braddock character in The Graduate. And uh, it was female full frontal nudity. Uh, and we did it in a very tasteful way where the lights went down and the blinds uh, from the window cast a shadow across her breast and across her um, her uh, her crotch. And <laughs> the second night, Tim, uh, the lights didn't go down. Oh, man, I and, feel bad um, for her. And it happened to be the night her husband, Susan was her name. She's a great actress. Um, and her husband happened to be there. And her husband is a super cool guy who runs like the House of Blues in Las Vegas, I think. So he had flown in to see this night. And she <laughs> she had a towel on. And the way it was supposed to go is the lights were supposed to go down because she turned the lights off. She's seducing Benjamin Bright. She played Mrs. Robinson, if you're familiar with the movie. And she drops the towel in our in our staging, and and then you know I could see everything, but from the audience's perspective, they couldn't. They could just see a suggestion. Well, that night it didn't go down, and she had a choice. Susan did to like, what is she going to do? So she decided to not drop the whole towel and said, "Just flash me." And I was downstage uh, right, and she just flashed me, and that corner of the audience saw it all. And I'll just, I never, I just, like, of all the light cues that I've ever been a part of to miss, that one. Uh, and luckily, you know, her husband was totally cool. And I, I'm, I'm a bit, you know, it's theater, so these things happen. But, you know, Susan was, like, a bit flabbergasted by it. Uh, and we went on, and it happens very early on the show. But uh, we all laugh about it. And, um, and unfortunately, uh, Susan uh, ended up passing away early from mm. from cancer, and I was able to tell this, relive this story during her uh, celebration of life uh, that we had. And you know, it's just a really funny story that that happens in theater. Like, but that anyway. So to take it back, um, that's the in the Playhouse here in Des Moines is the second longest running community theater in the country, behind the Little Petite Theater in New Orleans. And the only time that they had ever had full frontal nudity was in that, that production, and the lights didn't go <laughs> and down. you saw it. And, yeah, I was there. I was there, and we simulated sex throughout the whole time. Uh, Scott, throughout you're that, a married yeah, man. I, I, was, I wasn't at the time, okay. uh, but my grandma did come to that, to that show, and it was a little awkward for her. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm pretty much do every – I'd do anything um, on stage I've, I've, or on camera, as long as it serves the story and it's not for gratuitous reasons. All right. So I'm really, can I just apologize right now for having long winded answers to your question? I'm feeding your ego though. Okay. I mean, I, we spent, we spent 15 minutes on your intramural career. We did. Thank you. You know, and, and this is the time and the place for that. So we found your home. Here yeah. On the you, I Grand appreciate Show. it. Thank you so much for asking these questions. So you probably watch sports movies with a different eye than I do because I'm a sucker for, you know, the comeback and you know some of these cheesy sports movies that that make me cry when it's like maybe they're not a good movie but i'm a sucker for the soundtrack for the fat kid that gets in shape and wins it in the end what is your all-time favorite sports movie oh boy what you just said 
is now going to ring totally false because my favorite sports movie is Major League Two. Ooh. Yeah. I love Major League Two. So, yeah, Major League Two is the one where, like, where, where Charlie Sheen, who was the bad boy in the first one, he gets all corporate and he's doing right guard yep. commercials and and he's basically come, become like a Roger Dorn type of character. And then he has to find his arm. I will say, though, the girlfriend he has in two is just so smoking hot. <laughs> she's she's really it, good it, looking. It, yeah. And it, there's no doubt about it. And and that movie, I, it, it it's mostly nostalgia that makes it my favorite. It is the movie that we watched the most as kids because it just so happened to be on. Right. And uh we quote it. We still quote that movie. Me and my brother and my geographical brothers, my neighbors growing up, we quote that movie more than any. Like you're standing on the tracks and the train's coming through Butthead. Parkman. And, yeah. It, with, yeah. With Parkman. Uh, woo. Boils, boys fired up. Well, uh, and then you have uh, the start of that is white. Li- is it white lightning and black thunder? Yeah. So, and, and that's also the, uh, you have no marbles. Uh, yes. Uh, and, we they're got just, a guy, an uh, outfielder from the Giants. Yeah, not those Giants. It's yeah, the Yomiuri right. Giants. Yeah, and Bob Uecker's great in all of those. But it's, um, I, I just love that movie. As far as just like if I was going to, cr- like from a critical perspective, and that's my favorite sports movie. The greatest sports movie of all time is, boy, I don't know exactly. Rocky has got to be up there. That, not Rocky 2, 3, or 4, or 5, or 7, or t- 17. But Rocky 1 is a legitimately... All time great yeah. movie. That script is, oh, that script is so good. Well, character development, and you have Talia Shire and Sylvester Stallone that are just fantastic. You have you know Mickey in that is so good, and the brother in law Pauly is. Fa- I mean Apollo Creed yep. is. I mean that's an iconic like movie villain and movie and, character. and they get the. I guess part of it is they this, they get the sports right. They get the sports right, right, and and a lot of movies you can tell it's fake. And, you know, that's why I, you know, I really like something like Tin Cup. Tin Cup is a really good movie, you know, and, and obviously Kevin Costner knows how to hit a golf ball. You know, if you watch something like uh, Happy Gilmore, Adam Sandler does a good job, but uh, I forget the actor's name who plays Shooter McGavin. His swing isn't up to snuff. Right. I, I, you know, so th- those types of things, I'm, I'm among all the other things and happy, but I still like happy Gilmore and I get it, but getting the sports right. So it looks real enough. It's important. Is, it's, it's, it's important. Yeah. That's, that's the cool thing about sports movies is, um, it doesn't have to be, you know, Oscar caliber to be good, mm-hmm. you know, similar to major league. You can enjoy major league just as much you as enjoy Rocky just for different reasons, because that's what sports do to us. They draw us into the story. Mm-hmm. Um, if I were to pick like a favorite uh, sports role to play, I think I'd want to play Ricky Vaughn, number mm. one. Sure. But I don't think I'm like a, I'm not a badass enough. Like you can believe Charlie Sheen as a, like a strung out dude, badass motorcycle guy who was at the bar till four in the morning. Yeah. I'm, I'm not really that guy. I think I'd play Mel Clark from Angels in the Outfield a little bit better. <laughs> Um, one thing I like about the Tony Danza Mel Clark character is he pitches a lot in that yeah. movie. And I think I could pull off the pitching thing really well. Like I could, you know, I, I, I pitch, so I, I know what I'm yeah. doing there. What's your sports role that you think you could nail? Ooh, that's, oh, that's really good. Of course I want to be the hero, uh, but I'm probably more likely to, to be something that's, that's less athletic uh, so for me, it, it comes down to being the coach in a league of their own. Um, oh, yeah. Tom Hanks, of course, you would never want to follow or replicate what he does because it, it's just it's he's, singular. He's amazing. Yeah. Uh, but that is one of those sports roles that, damn it, do I wish I would have had that role. <laughs> God, you know, there's sometimes you see things that happen on on the big screen, and you just, at least for me, it just leaves me leaving the theater. Um, liking the movie less because my jealousy has raged so much and watching Tom Hanks parade around in that dugout in a league of their own is so, uh, it just spikes my jealousy because that is a great role. And he does, uh, even a, he, he does, he does a better job than that role is. And that's a really great role. So kudos to Tom. Who are your favorite underdogs and role players we're, we're a podcast about the underdogs and role players. That's our tagline here, Scott. Who are your favorite underdogs and role players in sports? 
Can I just say the 1990 Buffalo Bills? 1990s I Buffalo Bills. You're a Bills fan. Yeah. So Daryl Talley. Oh yeah, Steve Andre, Tasker. Yep, yep. Uh, you get Thurman Thomas, Jim Kelly. I mean, I know they're Hall of Famers, but uh, you know, it's even if you you move down. Well, the, the years backup of, quarterback, uh, uh, Frank Wright. Frank Wright. Yeah, that's right. He's a and moonlighter he, on that team. He'd be the moonlighter. He's. Him Boy, what a, what a story he has. Greatest comeback in NFL history and greatest comeback in college football history when he's at Maryland. Amazing. Amazing. You should get him on the program. Although he might be busy coaching. I'll text him. I'll see what uh, he's up to. But, yeah, I mean, the Bills uh, are all, all, all of them. I mean, Doug Flutie, to me, is a guy who um, makes it a bittersweet for me. I'm so happy he was a Bills quarterback, but the Bills screwed him over. They misused him, especially when they put Rob Johnson back in yeah, the they, playoff they game. Yeah, they really were going back and forth uh, between Rob Johnson yeah. and Doug Flutie. Today. You know, so smaller guys who rise above. I'm, you know, I I, I just have a a propensity because we, I'm projecting myself onto them. Right, you're the twelfth man on the Carroll High. That's team. right, and I think if I just got my shot, <laughs> if I just got my shot. If the coach would have been more into three pointers, <laughs> that's right. So Scott, the way we end every episode of the Moonlight Graham Show, and I know you're a big fan, and I know your wife is waiting somewhere for you to pick her up right now. Yeah, we'll have to we'll have to pick this up again. Look, I just invited myself back for part two. That's right. So this is the five big questions, Scott. Yeah, so ahead, buckle your seatbelt. First question is. What is the last movie to make you cry? It's strange because I haven't. I'm, this is my stall tactic. I haven't watched a lot of movies since uh, the COVID thing happened. So if I don't say a movie, I will say that uh, Sunderland Till I Die made me cry. I just I did watch that recently. Have you seen that? I've never even docu heard of series this. about the Sunderland Football Club in Sunderland, England. Um, it's it's two seasons long. And it just follows the clubs up and down as, as well as they Where get can you relegated. Watch it? Netflix. Sunderland Till I Die. Um, if you're a sports fan, watch this thing. Sunderland Till I Die. You cried. Yeah. A yeah, lot? Yeah. No, it wasn't a sobbing thing. There's just some really happy moments and there's some sad moments. You know, So like the last time I probably sobbed really hard at a movie um, was Green Mile. And that was a long time ago. <laughs> Because now I avoid movies that make me cry a lot. But the, otherwise, the last time I really sobbed like uncontrollably, c- uncontrollably would have been 15, 20 years ago when I watched the finale of Six Feet Under, which is the greatest finale in uh, TV history, Six Feet Under and HBO. I think mine was uh, Star is Born on the rewatch. Oh. I, I cried. Oh, I could never rewatch that. I, that did make me cry. Thank you for reminding me. I, of I that. had not seen the two previous stars born. So I didn't know. That I didn't know hurts. how it ended. And then, uh, that and like the, what was that family movie about adoption with Mark Wahlberg? Oh, I didn't see that. one. Oh, well, let me tell you, it's better than you think. Yeah, and okay. it'll, you'll cry. Well, I really try and actively avoid these types of movies. Second question here, Scott. Is, Although I want to be in these movies. That's the thing. I love acting in those movies. I don't ever want to watch them. I would be such a good, um, like, adoptive, dorky adoptive dad. You know, like, those movies you could where... Do it. You could adopt. Where, like, they're, the kids are really cool, but the parents are dorks. I'm the guy. I can I can play that role. You're too good looking to be a dork. Sorry. <laughs> Scott, it took us two hours to get there, but finally we, we, we made it. Well, you think it took two hours. Just wait till you go back and listen. <laughs> All right. Second question. What is the, the show you've been watched binge watched during quarantine that you're least proud of? I'm actually pretty proud that I haven't been watched anything other than Sunderland till I die. I, I've really not watched a lot of TV. I will say, though, I have been binging uh, magic tricks on YouTube. I have watched countless hours of magic tricks. Um, I've watched so much Penn and Teller fool us. And <laughs> I have now become, I have a couple of uh, pretty cool uh, card magic tricks in my, uh, in my arsenal now. I, I can't do any, I don't have any of the build. There's a lot of building and stuff that you can do to make some sweet magic tricks. But uh, that's what I've been binging a lot of is watching people do amazing card magic that'll be part the next time the part two we will describe your magic oh, tricks describe, because it's podcast. very visual yes yeah, yeah. uh 
Question three, what is the most starstruck you've ever been? I'm sure you've met, been able to meet some, some very cool people, especially like with the caucuses that go through Iowa. We all have kind of the opportunity to meet all the candidates. You know, I mean, yeah. you talked about this with Al Capone earlier, but most people in Iowa have also met, you know, all the presidents yeah. and, you know, all the people that have ran for presidents. Have, have you, it doesn't have to be political, but yeah. what, who's, what's the most starstruck you've ever well, met? Well, when I did meet Barack Obama, I made a fool of myself because I... I don't even want to say, I'll say it. It's just, I've made a fool Did you myself. talk about your Carol high three-pointers? Unfortunately, I, I did something similar. I talked about myself. And I I told him to watch Iowa Nice. God, I'm such an idiot. Like how you meet the most powerful person in the world and you make it about you. But I don't know, that's just idiocy. So I'm bringing it back around just to, to, to say that probably... Um, I had an opportunity. I was standing next to Mila Kunis... Um, at at Kinnick Stadium when we did the um, uh, Native Fund project with the Blake Shelton concert, and I talked to Ashton there and and Blake and I and and I just never felt like I should I just couldn't come bring myself to say hi to her uh, and uh, you know she was pregnant at the time and and I had an opportunity I stand right next to her it was just me and her uh, out there. Uh, kind of watching from backstage and I never said hi or how are you doing or anything. I just felt like I didn't quite have the line. So hopefully at some point here, I'll, I'll be able to make up for that and, and, and uh, tell her hi and how great of an actress I think she is. She's the work she did in black Swan and other movies is really great. Anyway, I need to answer these questions a little bit more um, <laughs> pithily. Go ahead. You might've mentioned this earlier with, with Tom Hanks in a league of their own. But what role reminds you most of you? You know, when you yeah. see a role that you watch and you're like, man, I could, I, I could have nailed that role. Oh, one that I could nail. Um, uh, really, anything that is a, uh, like a psychopathic killer, oh. I really feel like I can nail. Uh, I know that sounds disturbing, but um, <laughs> it's just true. I just... I I feel like um, I can pull those types of roles off really well. But on top of that, you know, if I think of, um, um, God, what's his name? Um, I forget, from Home Alone, he, the tall guy with the curly oh, hair. Um, Daniel something. Stern. Daniel Stern. Uh, you know, his his role in Rookie of the Year or something I could, I, oh. I feel like I could do. Um, and, you know, that that's a type of comedic role that, that would fit me well. Like neurotic. And- yeah. And, you know, I, but it, it's hard to answer this question without sounding egotistical, but this theme, has, the theme of this podcast has been Scott uh, having delusions of grandeur. So for me, I, I think Willy Wonka in the original Willy Wonka is something that I could have done really well. Um, Gene Wilder is an absolute idol of mine, somebody that I would love to replicate his career. And so I, I feel like I could have if i was back in the day been able to to bring something strange and uh majestic to that to that role because i'm not that good looking you know i have this i think i have this quality about me that is 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 somewhat approachable but have i have more of a dark side than i think people let on uh, know about me and so if i can just peel back the curtain a bit there's a, a slightly disturbing yet charismatic aspect God, this sounds really egotistical. You have re- done. You've done a nice job of peeling back <laughs> away this false modesty that I sometimes bring. Always start with high school basketball. That's the rule. That's the key. Final question here, Scott: Is yeah. what's the best advice you've ever received? Whatever you do, have fun. Uh, I was given that advice um, by a very old, wise, gay theater teacher um who had seen a lot in his life and had to deal with a lot in his life and uh, when i was in one of the darkest moments of my life um he called me i was too scared to answer at the time and he just left a message and he said scott whatever you choose to do have fun i was like you know and that's something that stuck with me uh it's it's very simple but it's true also, surround yourself with talented people and ask for help. That's a good one, and which I came up with myself. I just borrowed and put some things together. And also, if it's not a, if it's not a yes, or if it's not a 
Hell yes, it's a no. That's one Keith Murphy taught me, but I'm pretty sure that he stole that from somebody. Ooh. Also, Steal from the Best is one that I got from my uh, from Patrick Gowan, who is my acting teacher at Iowa State, but he stole that from Michael Caine, who said, Steal from the Best, and I'm sure that he stole it from somebody else. So that was my Michael Caine impression. Yeah, do you You're have welcome. a best impression that you can, you know, the parting shot? Well, I can do a couple couple of impressions. They're not really impressions, really. They're just sort of accents, I suppose. Um, what do you think this is? Because at first, I wanted to do an Irish accent, and then it sort of came out English, so I decided I'd just stick with it. I, I was thinking it was like a really happy Irish guy at first. Well, let me redeem myself and get Irish. I do my person. Irish a little lower. Okay, let me hear your Irish. We'll go back and forth. Do you know the quickest way down to the square? Well, that's pretty good there. I, I, I think you did a good job there, Tim well, Flattery. I've had, <laughs> I've had a little practice with the name Flattery. Really? It's pretty good. It's, it's a bit of Scottish, I think. <laughs> yeah. You're, yeah, I might have Scottish bleeding into mine, and you got like a little McCartney or yeah. like... Uh, oh, yeah, some Liverpool in there. Yeah. Well, yeah, so it, if, you're, if you're doing the Republic of Ireland, you just got to do the singy songy thing. You really go up and down, sort of like that. Um, if you're going to do Scottish, which is you do, do do the law of the register and you get it oh. more guttural. Yeah, that's uh, good. That's really good. You go back to England, tell them that Scotland's brothers and sisters are three. Yes, my island. There you go. <laughs> so anyway, I'll work on my accent. What so I about used to the do a Australian Bill one, but that's I, a, not a big leap to Australia. There. So Australian used to be my go-to. I used to do a Steve Irwin impression, uh, and because I have done Irish on stage and I've done Cockney on stage so much that the placement of the of the tongue and the sound in different registers it, it's made me lose my Irish. So are, are my my Australian. So whenever I try and do Australian now, it just goes into to 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 yeah. cockney really fast so I, if i start off and i'll be like you know get, did the dingo eat your baby you'd be like oh well i'm just a cockney man right here you know the governor's here so that's how it ends up working out for me i gotta go back at some point and get my australian back because it was my first one ever and i just you know yeah, i lost it i lost it along the way and, Thanks to and we lost McDonough. this podcast a whole while back. So if, yeah. you, if you stayed I on hope. to this, thank you. But Scott, thank you so much for for joining the Moonlight Graham Show. This has been this has been fun. Well, I genuinely appreciate you asking me questions about um, acting. I don't get to talk about it enough, and I, I, from the deepest part of my heart, Tim, I genuinely appreciate getting to talk about the craft. And and next time, maybe we can talk more about. Um, filmmaking itself uh, hopefully next time i come on the kinnick documentary will finally be finished and uh, it's been uh, seven years in the making and we always seem to be two years away from being two years away but i think we're actually only one week away from it being watchable so Ooh, well, soon. congratulations and we can't wait to i can't wait to watch it so. and i also need to work on my accents because i kind of feel embarrassed at this point <laughs> thanks yeah thank you Tim. Embarrassed at this point <laughs> Hey guys, thanks once again to listening to today's episode of the Moonlight Graham Show. And even though I do most of the interviews here on the podcast, there is a ton of work that happens behind the scenes that you guys don't see that make each episode possible. So I got to give a shout out to the Moonlight Graham Show team. First of all, Brian Sandvig, our producer. Brian does all of the post-production work. And in real life, he's not just a podcast producer. He's also a real estate agent. So if you're looking to buy or sell a home, down in the Kansas or Missouri areas, give Brian Sandvig a call. Next guy on that list is Brendan Gargano. Brendan does all of our design and artwork here on the podcast. He's one of the most talented artists I've ever met, and I love all of his work. If you need any help on the design side with logos or anything like that, give Brendan Gargano a call. The next guy on that list is Andy Flattery, my older brother. Andy, of course, has done some of the of the interviews here on the podcast. He also is a certified financial planner. He owns a business called Simple Wealth Planning. If you need any help in that area, check Andy Flattery out. And then, of course, the trusty co-host, Tom Griffin, and my younger brother, Neil Flattery. Those guys are just busy being husbands, being fathers. They're family men, but also they do a ton of work here on the show. So thanks again for listening. We really appreciate you guys subscribing and supporting the Moonlight Graham Show.